Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I was up in the middle of the night last night because we had storms coming through in this part of the world, as in tornado-type weather, and luckily it didn't really affect my area, but we did um, have a lot of winds, and, and it was kind of kind of freaky there for a little while, but I didn't have any problems really other than that. Okay, I want to start this video with I am Legion, who has done another deep dive. Check this out. Polysign, Fides, and MoneyGram. Warning, lots of dot connecting inbound. Keywords, Interledger FX, Bulks, internal, Internally Treasury Function, New Revenue Stream. Um, so let's get going here. Kaiman P, this is the guy at Polysign. Polysign, Interledger FX, Dell HP. So he's got Kaiman, I'm not even going to try that to say that last name, but it shows now that this guy is with, um, he's been, he's with Polysign, but it also shows Interledger FX. Um, and then he's got this where it shows that he's at Polysign, and then he shows that he's Polysign, he used to be at Dell, and then he was um, at Data Direct Networks, and then here at Hewlett Packard. Um, so this guy's obviously a sharp cookie. Now, FIDE's Treasury Services presentation. Block this is a presentation by Ripple prepared for FIDE's, um, which uh, connect faster. The future of real-time payments. So he's got these slides here. And he's pointing to the spot funding operations, bulk funding process. He's also pointing here, real-time cross-border payments enable shift to spot funding. Then he's right here. It says spot funding reduces idle cash FX risk and counterparty exposure. And then he's got these slides: vendor payments, bidding, and buyer functional currency supporting local currency pricing. And down here it says Amex Ripple. Let me see. I think there's one more. Now here it says blockchain and the future of real-time payments. Fides Treasury Services to use a single ledger. Use, uh, usage of digital assets for transactions, interledger protocol, spot funding reduces idle cash, FX risk, and counterparty exposure. Now, the next thing that I want to show you, this is a, a video from one of Sam I.M.'s videos, and it's actually, if you want to subscribe to him on YouTube, where he did this video, it's To the Lifeboats. He's really, really good um, at finding information and digging things up. Really smart guy. MoneyGram FX Treasury Function. Um, watch this video from Sam I am. This is, um, it doesn't say when it's from, but it's a, a while back. Remember, this is two weeks before MoneyGram was announced. This is David Schwartz, CTO of Ripple. Listen to what he says. I have a bank that doesn't want to touch a digital asset. They're like, we can't have XRP on our books. We can't buy it. We can't sell it. It's just too much of a regulatory challenge for us. But let's say they want to make a payment in Mexico and they don't want to have to pre-fund and they want, they don't want to have to work, get you know, confirmation three days later, what they can do is they can have an ex-rapid customer that probably won't be a bank. It'll be a payment company or some other type of institution. Oh, wait, wait. They can have an ex-rapid customer. MoneyGram's an ex-rapid customer. Check. There probably won't be a bank. Oh, well, they're not a bank. Check. It'll be a payment processor. Check. Or some other company. Check. And what did the, the Alex just say? Oh, new revenue stream check what do you think they're doing folks that uses a digital asset to buy the mexican pesos as an internal treasury function and then offers those mexican pesos to the bank for a profit generating a new revenue stream ding 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 are you guys paying attention okay let me Actually, yeah, we can, there's a little more. So it's a workaround to the limitations that we found that we think is adapted to the way that, to the situation that we're in today. It's a workaround that we found, again, two weeks before MoneyGram gets announced, they've been searching for this workaround and they've found it. Oh, well, but this is theoretical, guys. This is all theoretical. They haven't actually been doing it. Well, wait, well, actually, I guess they have. 
Okay, so that was pretty darn interesting. So now if you look down here, it says credit um, XRP chat. He doesn't know the handle. And another was an interview at Money 20 with Stefan Thomas explaining relationship between Ripple interledgers and XRP. Since the interledger protocol is designed for interoperability and reach, what if Ripple was able to connect the FX market, e-commerce, and cross-border payments to create one massive network of international liquidity? This might sound like a long shot, but I think it's possible given that Ripple's technology is the best solution for all these markets. E-commerce has trillions of dollars in sales and whatnot per year, while FX markets handle over $5 trillion per day. There was also an interesting concept from a document by Earthport, which may be partnered with Ripple. We know they're partnered with Ripple now, by the way, on cross-border payments, and it reads um, from page 12. The bulk of e-commerce transactions are domestic, that is, consumers and businesses buying from e-commerce merchants based on their own country, based in their own countries. However, approximately 15% of e-commerce transactions are made by overseas buyers. This is fueled by large e-retailers e in developed markets that localize their sites for sales to consumers in rapidly growing markets such as China and Brazil. In, in some markets, cross-border e-commerce has as high as 40%. PayPal reports that nearly 25% of all, transact, all its transactions are cross-border. Significant portion of its volume is e-commerce although it also handles significant B2B and remittance payments. All right, so let's see if he's got anything else here. Who is FIDS Treasury Service? FIDS is a global leader in multi-bank connectivity, enabling corporates to connect to any bank in any region through any channel. FIDS helps more than 3,000 clients communicate with more than 10,000 banks globally within 170 countries. Whether you are using a treasury management system enterprise resource planning system or FIDS web applications or any combination thereof, FIDS is the only bank connectivity platform you need. As an independently operated subsidiary of Credit Suisse, FIDS offers SWIFT connectivity to corporates who do not have their own SWIFT VIC, is that VIC code by, by leveraging the lead banking model. FIDS also provides conversion, validation, and security services. We, we are known for our outstanding project management, da, da, da. All right, and then there's another slide here. Um, onboarding multiple banks and accounts is time consuming and, and was particularly so for Payoneer. Many of their banks are small and are not on the SWIFT network, requiring some unique solutions. FIDE's hybrid model and commitment to delivering customer solutions has paid off Payoneer. Together, Payoneer and FIDE's developed and perfected various alternatives to achieve straightforward through pro straight through process. FIDE was able to support our wide variety of unique vendors and was quite helpful in offering creative solutions and alternatives to support the small non-SWIFT banks and payment providers who could only provide transaction inf information via email. Pretty fascinating thread here. And then Mickey, Mickey B. Fresh comes in right here. Now look at this, Interledger FX, Arthur Brito, PolySun, so PolySun, which is the secret of project we've been, I mean, PolySun. Also, Arthur Britter is in charge of that. Well, now he apparently is running another company called Interledger FX. Arthur Brito, president of Interledger FX. So that's from Mickey B. Fresh. What a find. So that's good stuff from I Am Legion and Mickey B. Fresh and Sam I Am, who's to the lifeboats, all kinds of people that contributed to that. Good stuff. All right, David the Priest sent me this. This is an article from Zero Hedge, which has a lot of advertising on it. Global Jubilee looms as G20 finalizes debt relief program for world's poorest countries. Just wanted to read you a couple of quotes out of this. Um, this is the fastest way to keep money in countries to use in, in responding to the current crisis and to ensure public money is not wasted, bailing out profits of rich private speculators. Um, and then down here. The official said there's a very clear recognition that a global coordinated approach is a must to avoid an emerging market debt crisis. Um, and then this person says there must be a level playing field. So all creditors agree to the same key parameters, she said. Both with that in place, there's always a need for bilateral discussions between each creditor and debtor nation. And China could work within that framework. They are very much involved. And I think there will be a part of an agreement. And then it goes on. You cannot. Uh, down here, 
and it appear, appears the world is in the end of is is at the end of a decades long monetary experiment where ushering in more quantitative easing to fix below trend growth or instabilities in the financial casino will not work this time. This person who's a fund manager at Tresses Gestion recently said QE will not fix this, swap lines will not fix this, a debt jubilee will fix this, or multiple trillions of dollars in write downs and defaults. Internet search term for debt jubilee has surged in the to the highest level not seen since late 2012. These are the searches for debt jubilee. And we need to give a lot of credit here because Brad Combs and Cryptopolis were talking about this a week or two ago. So those guys, and Brad did a video on it, I know, and I know that Cryptopolis has been um, contributing to this conversation. They both have channels, give them both a subscribe. Cryptopolis on YouTube and Brad Combs Investment Perspectives on YouTube. All right. Now, let's look at uh, this. This is from Sir Gordon Gecko. This is a video he posted um, here in the last 24 hours. 20 to assist you with more funding under SDR, and specifically, what do you need from America? What I, I have to recognize is the uh, tremendous stepping up of our membership, uh, including the United States, by making it possible to have in a timely manner the one trillion dollars i spoke about as part of the two trillion dollars uh, stimulus package there was a component supporting the uh, uh, naps this is the authority of the imf to borrow that boosts our resources <coughs> so our first demand is indeed make sure that we have the resources the one trillion dollars I, I spoke about available and now, now we do when we look into the future if this crisis continues for a longer period of time and this is the uncertainty that we are wrestling with or if there is a second wave of the epidemic uh, which epidemiologists are saying is not completely out of question then we need to look into further beefing up the uh, resources of uh, uh, the International Monetary Fund. And uh, uh, to explain to the, uh, to the viewers, the SDRs uh, is a fast way to provide liquidity to all countries. Uh, it was done after the uh, uh, shock that came in 2008. In 2009, there was a boost of 250 billion SDRs that were spread among the membership to improve the liquidity position. Why is this uh, valuable? Because many emerging markets find themselves hit by a health crisis, by a standstill in their own economies, and on top of it, capital outflow, capital flying to safety. Some hundred billion dollars have left emerging markets. That makes the liquidity position of these countries uh, more challenging. And at that moment, uh, a uh, emission of SDRs can provide a much needed liquidity boost. There you go, SDRs. Now, um, you know, one thing that we're seeing a lot of going around now is about how there's got to be some kind of financial reset. And a lot of people don't believe this. I'll, I'll, I'll um, show you where the people that run the world or run the, country, the United States, they're saying it themselves. It's not just a bunch of kooky people on YouTube saying it. the most powerful people in the world are saying it. But this is from a guy who wrote, who literally wrote the book. I'll show you his book. He wrote the book, The Big Reset, and it's called The Big Reset, War on Gold and the Financial Endgame. So what is, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he says, so what is a big reset? It's probably not a one-time event, but a series of important changes coming to the international monetary system, which started in 1944 Bretton Woods Conference, when the dollar became the anchor for the IMS. Um, the U.S. promised the dollar would be as good as gold and could always be exchanged for gold at $35 per ounce. Russia and China chose not to be part of the new IMS. All was well till the 60s. So under the Bretton Woods rules, gold was the basis for the dollar, and other currencies were pegged to it. The Bretton Woods system effectively came to an end in the early 1970s when President Nixon announced that the U.S. would no longer exchange dollars for gold. Um, and then it goes on and on, but I wanted to get down here and read you this part. 
Nixon's Secretary of State Kissinger had a plan. He convinced the Saudi royal family to an agreement in which the U.S. would offer military protection for the royal family and Saudi Arabia's oil fields. In return, the Saudis would price their oil in dollars. They and OPEC agreed. So the collapse of the petrodollar deal would probably be the last nail in the, co in the coffin for the dollar as the anchor for the world's monetary system. That's why the high five photo of Putin, and it's one of the guys, I think, from Saudi Arabia. Yes, a new anchor will, uh, be, will need to be found after a collapse. Um, so anyway, it, it says, nor the euro or the renminbi are ready for this role. Probably only the SDR, the currency basket of the IMF, could be upgraded to such a prominent role in the near future. That's why this is a central part of the recent thesis, uh, reset thesis. Now, um, for those of you that are listening that are, oh, yeah, this global reset, this is all crazy talk. Well, let me show you who's talking about it um, if you think, if you're one of the ones that thinks this is all crazy talk. This is a tweet from Chris Giancarlo yesterday. Let's see, I think it was yesterday. No, it was two days ago. Money reimagined as tech politics and the current events collide, a global reset looms. Now, who's Chris Giancarlo? It's, it's important that you know who Chris Giancarlo is because this guy's big time. All right. And we've talked about him before. He's an American attorney and former business executive who served as the 13th chairman of the United States Commodity Futures Cra Trading Commission in, in um, starting on January 20th, 2017, with President Donald Trump's inauguration, Giancarlo began serving as act acting chair of the CFTC. So this guy ran the CFTC, and now it's that Heath Parbert guy or something, but this guy ran the CFTC, but it's not done yet, folks, because this this all ties together, folks. Pay attention. Here we go. What else does Chris Giancarlo do? Well, for one thing, he's the guy that the Trump administration, um, that basically the way I read it, hold on, I'm going to have to stop this. My, my thing disconnected. Sorry, somehow my mic got disconnected. But anyway, so this Chris Giancarlo guy, this is an article from October 22nd, 2019. Listen to the quotes. One of the untold stories of the past few years is that the CFTC, the Treasury, the SEC, and National Economic Council Director at the time, Gary Cohn, believed that the launch of Bitcoin futures would have the Im impact of popping the Bitcoin bubble, and it worked. So they all met to pop the Bitcoin bubble. Um, we saw a bubble building, and we thought the best way to address it was to allow the market to interact with it. Giancarlo told a crowd gathered at the Ritz Carlton on Knob Hill. If you, um, without shorts, markets have, has no pessimists. If you do believe it's ridiculous, it's a ridiculous price, but you don't own, but you don't own here. There, there's no way to express that view. Giancarlo told, told CoinDesk, adding, if you don't believe that derivative, if you don't, <laughs> sorry, if you don't have that derivative, then all you've got are believers, and it's belie it's a believers market. In the CF, the CFTC the staff handled it strictly on procedural grounds. But at the leadership level, I communicated with Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and NEC Director Gary Cohn, and we believed that should Bitcoin futures go forward, it would allow institutional money to bring dis discipline to the value of the cash market. Giancarlo told CoinDesk, and that's exactly what happened. All right. So this guy was was one of the people that was in charge of bringing the Bitcoin price down. Remember, Trump sees Bitcoin as a national security threat. He's he's tweeted anti tweets about Bitcoin. You've heard Christine Lagarde of the IMS say it's not Bitcoin and it's not Ethereum. Meanwhile, who's in charge of the digital dollar project? Chris Giancarlo, who backs the digital dollar project Accenture, one of the first investors in Ripple. And here's another tweet from Chris Giancarlo. Uh, when Chris Larson the other day tweeted out that he had the current thing that's going on, but he was recovering, who sees it and says, great news, stay well, Chris, right? Chris Giancarlo. All right. I think I'm going to end the video there and I'll pick up with some other things in the next video. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family that apparently Chris Giancarlo is glad to see Chris Larson getting well.
as well as as I am as well. 